Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome back to the Teamwork Advantage and Happy New Year, everybody. Wow, we've taken a couple of weeks off to get things going and end up the new year. And I hope you're ready to really rock and roll this new year as we get things into position. My name is Greg Gregory, certified speaking professional, founder of TeamsRock.com and trainer on teamwork, leadership and culture. I'm always fascinated in trying to learn new things. And so the podcast is really helping me learn and develop as well as sharing the knowledge that we're getting with everybody else. And by the way, if you're part of our OPT system on Purpose Teams, you know one of our key words is sharing knowledge. That's absolutely critical. Doing that with us today, uh, joining us from uh, the western part of the United States, is we're going to find Dr. Carla Fowler. Now, she's one of those folks I would sometimes refer to guys as, a, as an, uh, an underachiever. She has her MD. She also has her PhD. So you tie both of those together. We've got somebody here who's really going to share things with us. And we've been talking a little bit, so I don't think she's going to go over our heads too much here today. We're going to try and keep it to that level and make sure we get it. I'm fascinated by her topic. So she is an MD and a PhD, as well as an elite executive coach. For the last decade, she has been the secret weapon for scores of CEOs, entrepreneurs, and other senior leadership folks all around the country and the world. Her unique approach combines the latest in research from, and here's the key words, folks, performance science with timeless best practices to help top performers level up and achieve their goals. Now, remember, folks, performance science. We've heard about this with coaches in sports. Michael Phelps had a performance coach. All these folks, very strong performances. What about our businesses? Are we doing the best to get our brains focused? Are we doing the best to get our minds working in the right direction? So Dr. Fowler, welcome to the Teamwork Advantage. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're excited about this. And before we get all the way into this, you know, I was teasing a little bit in your introduction, you know, an MD and a PhD. That's that's just powerful when you look at that. And so now we're combining both the practical knowledge as well as the application knowledge with everything. How did you get here? You didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to speak on and coach on uh, performance science. How did you get there? This is a great question. And uh, you know, often in some of these interesting sort of powerful stories, we find that there's like a combination of different things. Like I've listened to a few of your guests on your shows and like, they didn't do just one thing. You know, they often have a little bit of that winding pathway that then sort of brings this potent cocktail together. And, you know, for me, I think the core of this started very young, but it was just this real interest in more or less like, Number one, I liked being good at things and I was really fascinated at trying to understand like how it is you go about that. And this started probably as early as like fifth grade, but I had this, this thought that like, if you keep putting yourself up against challenging things and challenging situations, whether that was sports, whether that was academically, that you would have to figure out like what to do, what techniques, what habits would be the most useful. And so I guess you could say I started to have this proxy of like looking around and saying, hey, what's the most challenging thing that I have access to right now? And then saying, okay, I'll go do that. Let's see what it pulls out of me. And, but ultimately, you know, I got into sort of the medicine and science path because I was a total math nerd. And I was like, I, I don't really understand how we study history, but I really understand how we do the problem solving in like math and science. And I like that. And it didn't, you know, miss me that, hey, going to med school is challenging. Getting into medical school is challenging. And that appealed to me as well. I think the final piece was I definitely had this desire to do something practically that would really help people. Like I loved that sense of making an impact and having that impact be really clear. So then it's reasonable to ask the question, okay, so you went to med school, how'd you get the PhD? 
And that was really sort of a fortuitous coincidence. At some point, another college peer of mine came up and said, well, you know, Carla, they have these dual degree programs where you get to study both scientific research and how you do that and get trained in that kind of thinking. And you go to med school and they'll pay you because it takes twice as long. So I was like, not only does that sound fun, but it sounds like a really good deal. And so that is how I ended up on that sort of dual pathway. But That's impressive again- that you said that that was fun <laughs> because those who know me on the podcast here know that I always tell, I was in that part of class that made the upper half possible. So for me, that would have not been <laughs> oh, fun. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, um, not all of it was fun, of course. Like, oh, no. of course, anyone who says it was all fun is is full of it. But yeah. I think, <laughs> I think, I think the key was I understood at that point in time that part of what builds our sense of like self efficacy and our confidence comes from testing ourselves, and and also that continual growth, but also sort of building resources and assets, whether those are degrees or whether those are just um, the amount of learning that was going to take place, that there was going to be, even if I didn't totally know how, what I was going to do exactly, I was like, that um, makes a lot of sense to me. And then it's totally reasonable to ask the question like, okay, so you graduated from that program 10 years ago. How did you get into performance science coaching? Like how, right. how did that happen? Now all of a sudden we're looking at taking medical plus your PhD and putting it into practical use. And in the last, I'm going to say five years, probably a lot, but even in the last 10 to 15, there has been more of an emphasis on the mental stability of in the workplace as well. So how do you get, how do you get to the coaching and then how do we tie that all together? Yeah. Well, so one of the interesting things you have to kind of decide where you're going to head in medicine and I think one of the things I was recognizing as I was in my intern year of residency, so I was studying to be a general surgeon and I was at Stanford and I got there because I loved how the surgeons had to think about problems, right? Like that there, it was not just high performance in terms of their, the skill with their hands, their ability to, you know, not cut the wrong thing, but that actually the amount of decision-making and thought performance that went into choosing, are you going to operate or not operate on someone was fascinating to me on the other side, I really liked psychology, but was pretty clear. I didn't want to be a psychiatrist that that piece of the profession. And so ultimately, as I was beginning to try and put together and find my home in medicine, I was struck by the fact that I couldn't quite place the things I was most fascinated in, which was really like that, that mental performance, that performance around teams and how does that work, the psychology of it. But again, not on the side of mental illness, much more on that sort of upside or that that performance side. Mm-hmm. And there really wasn't a home for that. And, and then you have to say, all right, if I'm going to work 80 hours a week on something, you really have to ask yourself, are you in the place where you're going to have the most passion, the most fascination that just like drags you to work every day in, in that good way? Like you, you can't mm-hmm. imagine not going and doing the thing. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you get to do it. You don't have to do it. Exactly. And I think I just looked around and you have that hard moment when you're like, oh, shoot, this is not quite it. But I'm early in the residency journey. You know, I have my MD. There's a lot of training left, but I think I need to go create my own thing. And it's actually a practice that exists outside medicine. It is actually a practice that is in the coaching, like coaching and leadership development realm. Mm -hmm. It's not actually in medicine. And as you can imagine, it wasn't the most popular decision. (laughs) Most people don't choose to leave at that point. But I think I had gotten enough training from the science piece about how to think about a problem, which is in its essence, very much like entrepreneurship. Like how do you design a methodology? How do you think through, Mm -hmm. for example, performance science and say, if you wanted to work with leaders, if you wanted to work with people who were setting ambitious goals and help them improve how they were thinking about the problems, how they were approaching the uncertainty that occurs with risk, that I actually had a lot of training in how to start to say, all right, what do I need to read? What do I need to think about? And then how do you actually design a way of dialoguing and interacting with people? 
methodology that helps them apply it and use it for very practical stuff, not just academically think about it. Right. So that brings us to the question. You had mentioned, as we were chatting a little bit before we got on here, you had mentioned about high-level sports. And this is not just about high-level sports, but you had a background mm -hmm. in high-level sports. Tell us about that and how that kind of came into play because performance science, we think about it from an athletic point. Mm -hmm. How did you yeah. bridge that gap? And well, also one, tell us a little bit of what performance science oh, really is. Yeah, happily. Well, so I think about performance science as more or less all the different like fields and thinkers that are asking questions about what helps us do our best work or create our best results as human beings. And so those could be athletic results, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. but also that could be business results, right? Or leadership results in, in other realms. And so in terms of, I played a lot of sports. I rode crew in college. And after that, I played ultimate Frisbee for about a decade and won a world championship. And the thing for me minute, that was- ultimate Frisbee world championships? Yeah, there are. I, uh, yes, <laughs> I played in the beach ultimate Frisbee world championship in 2000, let's see, what was that? 2007 in Brazil. So yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think I have a brain that's always looking for what's, what are the patterns? What are the, what's the commonalities? And I think because I was trying to challenge myself, not just scholastically or professionally, but also athletically, I saw all these parallels between both mentally, what do you need to be doing and effort wise, what do you need to be thinking about as you train for something? And that could be training for a sport, but it also could be, you know, what's the effort you're putting in to grow and learn and increase other skill sets. Um, and so in, in the field of performance science, I'm not the first person to notice this obviously. And certainly it had its roots in athletics. You know, how do you create better athletes? How do you go mm -hmm. win an Olympic medal? But rapidly people started to understood that not only was that not physical, it has mental components also, but they also started to notice that, wait, these principles we're training athletes in, in terms of their toughness, their resilience, their endurance matter a lot in other fields, like in the military, they mattered in the operating room or the cockpit. And then rapidly from there, people started to say, well, those all have a physical component to it, even though they're a profession, but actually we have to think about, you know, this, even in just straight up business, it is not unstressful to be a CEO, you are facing competition. There's not an Olympics, right? But you are every day trying to say like, are we winning? Are we improving our score at business, right? right. Whether that's revenue growth or scale. And so these, that's how the field sort of evolved to say, there's something useful in what we were thinking about for athletes that we really need to expand well beyond that. Often leaders are thinking about how do I lead my team? Yes. And they're thinking about the team development. And I'm, I teach team leadership, of course, and it's about building high performing teams. Mm -hmm. So we do have to think about that. So leaders have to kind of be almost in the performance science arena themselves to be able to coach their players. Yes. Okay. That's mm -hmm. part, but even more, they've got to be able to focus on themselves. So talk to us a little bit about that difference that a leader has to go through. This is, this is a great question. And in some ways, the first thing you said, that's really important is leaders need to be thinking at a couple different levels. So there's mm -hmm. themselves, but they also have to be thinking about their team. And, you know, there's lots of performance science out there. And I think one of my first jobs as I was beginning to coach in it and think about it was actually to distill it and do some simplification. Because one of the first things that gets in the way for us, I think, is when we're trying to sort through a bunch of noise and say, do I need to do everything? What, you know, what's actually going to help me the most? Mm -hmm. And so I really distilled a couple of principles that I think are really useful that a leader can both think about and practice for themselves but then also can then say, okay, and then how am I doing this with my team? Okay. And we share those yeah. principles. 
Please, yes, I would love to. <laughs> so I think one of the first uh, important pieces, and this relates back sort of to the bucket around strategy, but I think mental clarity about what are you trying to accomplish and the ability to articulate that first to yourself, but then of course, it's important to be able to articulate that to your team as well. And so there's both, what are you trying to accomplish? And we could think of this as goals. I like to actually talk about it sort of separate from that. Some people love goals. Some people hate goals. Like we hear about goals, goals, goals all the time. So Especially I just like to say, year. oh, it's a great point. <laughs> so I just say, what is it you want to accomplish both for yourself, but also with your team and what is actually most important to driving towards that? So you start with the assumption you are not going to do everything. You're not going to accomplish everything and you're not going to be able to do everything that might impact your progress towards your goal. And so as a leader, I think one of the first most important things is to give yourself some time to think about that question, not just to have to decide and make decisions that ride on that if you haven't given yourself some time to think about it. And I often recommend journaling or writing as you're doing some of that thinking, because when we're forced to actually put something into words, it engages with our brains in a yes. different way than if we're just in images or feelings or emotions. You could start with those things, but then it's great to translate that vision I had when I closed my eyes. Let me try and describe it. Let me paint the picture to somebody else because as a leader, you're going to have to paint the picture for someone else. And that's your team mm -hmm. because helping your team basically see the field and understand like how you're going to play the game together. What does it look like to win? And, and where, if resources are tight or time is tight, like where do you want to be prioritizing effort? Like what are the bets you're going to make on that? Those are really powerful things to communicate to your team that actually are very, not only aligning, but also are very motivating. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Like and people want to know how to contribute. Was, the phrase you used, you talked about, what is it that you want to accomplish? And you also said, what is important? Yes. And then the key one that I took out, which you said before that was, you're not going to accomplish everything. Now, I don't know about all of our listeners here, but I can tell you that's a big challenge I personally have is I want to get it all done. And I suffer <laughs> from that. Okay. But it's, a, it's now what do I want to get done? But now what's important about ranking that? and then being able to share that with your team members. Would you say that that kind of goes all hand in hand, all of that? I think it's all related and it's useful to do together that like it's additive and often one question sort of follows the next, right? Mm -hmm. The first layer of focus, as you said, is you're not going to do everything. You're not going to hit every goal you could conceive of. What goals matter to you most? And then secondly, in the how of how you're going to work towards that, saying, well, we're probably not going to be able to do everything we could list that might be able to get us there. So of those things, what do we want to focus our energy on? Right. And yeah. So that's like principle number one, I call it brutal focus. And it's, mm -hmm. I call it brutal because it's what you said. You said, I have a hard time with this. And Greg, you are not alone. We all feel a sense of loss when we actually come to terms with, oh, I'm not going to do it all. I think it is actually can be a very freeing premise to start with to say, no, nope, I'm not going to do it all. And nobody else is going to do it all either. So we are in the business of choosing and it's in mm -hmm. that choosing, it's in that making a bet that that's where performance actually really comes to play. It's in how well we can make those choices and focus our efforts. Okay. So principle one, you said was brutal focus. Yes. Okay. There's like seven minor principles within that, I think, but that's true. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's always the case. We yeah. can go down a rabbit hole in just about any of these, oh, but absolutely. I, I like uh, being able to come back up. Brutal focus. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So let's <laughs> talk about from brutal focus. What's your next principle? So I think the next principle is really around this idea of cultivating power for yourself. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, you know, there's strategy 
And then there's also execution, right? Like how well can you actually go do those things that you identified that were most important? And as a leader, you could think about these on two levels. As a leader, you're probably not doing a lot of the work. If you've got a, if you've got a team, in fact, what you're trying to do is like facilitate them having the resources and removing roadblocks for them and getting them visibility so that they can actually do Mm -hmm. a lot of what the work is. Right. And you are working. It's just what your work looks like is a little bit different often. And so as a leader, you can think about what is it that I need to be doing and how can I actually increase my own abilities or resources to be able to do that well? And that's what I mean by cultivate power. So for example, as a leader, if you're like, ah, I am in meetings, like back-to-back meetings all day, and I am trying to support my team. But what I'm realizing is that while I feel like I'm giving it all to my team, that my team might benefit more if I actually scheduled some time when I was actually not engaging with them so I could think and get ahead so that, again, I could anticipate or make sure that as they're having questions about clarity or where are we headed or how do we want to do this piece, I'm there with them. Like I'm ready. I've I've done some thinking already and I'm not a bottleneck for them, for example. With regards to your team, you can also be thinking about how do I help them scale their capabilities? And that could be how do I think about their growth and development? You brought it up really early. You got to be coaching your team. Like, how do you make sure that they have growth trajectories? Because that is something, another piece of motivation that it's easy to talk about. I need to motivate my team. But often the things that help us motivate our teams aren't just, they're not the rah-rah. They're not the cheerleader. That's important, but they're, have I given people the ability to contribute? And are they feeling themselves grow? Am I helping them identify and put some challenges, some healthy challenges in front of them that increase their capabilities mm-hmm. and, and the opportunity to do that? Are we basically in getting them more engaged and keeping them yes. engaged? Great way to put that. Yeah. That's, yes. that's exactly. another one of our keywords from our on-purpose teams is we've got to make sure everybody's engaged. And, it's, and here's the interesting part from my take. You help me out if you're uh, on the same page here. I believe that getting people engaged is not just a job of the leader. It's a job of every member on the team to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. This is such an important point. And I think that's why when we think about the relationships within a team and how a team is even structured, number one, I think not just having development flow from the leader to a team member, like where the leader sets the goals for that team member and then they meet it, but having team members be participating in how do they want to grow? What is an interesting challenge to them? So having them really drive that. But also the other thing is cultivating peer-to-peer relationships on your team. Not only does that mean that you start to say, hey, not everything needs to go through me, right? I don't need to be the bottleneck for everything. How can you brainstorm together? How can you push each other? When you come across something that you know might impact, like a decision your piece of the team is making that might impact someone else, are you proactively going to talk to them and say, hey, I love your input on this. Here's where we're headed. You know, what else do you see that I'm not seeing? Or, you know, these are the kinds of where you almost want their first instinct to be not to go to you, but to go to their teammate. Right. And that brings in more of a participative leadership style as opposed to more of the authoritative leadership style. People think they've got to go to the leader, hey, what do I do here? Versus the leader coming to them and saying, what is your thoughts on this and getting them all engaged? So Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, it's very well said. And it's, it's so critical that we get this going in that direction. Today's environment, I don't want to use the, the, the P word, the pandemic, but we're coming out of it. There are a lot of organizations that are true, what I call true hybrid, which yeah. means a certain set of team members go into the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday, others go in Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or whatever they, they do different days, and they, they've got their structure. Then there are others who are back in person completely, which I think is more on the minute side, 
And then you've got others that are, some of my clients use the term presence with purpose, some say remote first, certain, mm -hmm. so some people can go in when they need to go in, but it's allowing them to drive and live where they want to live. Like you're traveling mm -hmm. on the road for your work and that works with yeah. you, but it might not work in some other places. So right. leaders today have to understand the different styles of what they need to do. How, mm -hmm. when they're pressed for time and maybe some people are in remote areas, some of my clients work and some of the listeners here are in multiple time zones, even mm -hmm. around the world. So that gets to be a challenge. So what are things when somebody's really pressed for time, what's the best way a leader can do? What can a leader do to really make sure he or she's investing the right time doing the right thing? Well, that's a very broad question. <laughs> I'm um, trying to not make it as broad as it was. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're asking the money question, of course. And that's why often like we, we break things down. I, I think some things as a leader, one should consider what are the, what are the tools that people are most sort of naturally using to connect and communicate um, is, is one thing you got to consider. And, and so sometimes that's meeting on Zoom. Sometimes, like if you need everyone together, all together at the same time, but sometimes things like Slack or email or a quick phone call are tools that people might be more comfortable using that are the appropriate tool for the job of what is the connection that's needed? What's the communication that's needed? And every team is going to be different. And, but I think it's worth not judging a tool and saying, well, well, this is the tool, the only tool, oh, yeah. but actually to there try is and, no one silver to bullet. Right. And we have different generations in the workplace. And so what are the tools are going to be a little bit different. Hmm. And there is always some compromise in the sense of like, it's not just let every person decide what they want. But again, I think there's also a little bit of saying, here's what I expect. And here's what we need as a team to be connected, to be communicating. Mm -hmm. Well, there can be some room to say as a team, how do you want to accomplish that? Like, here are the results we want. And here's like, how are we going to know that we're achieving that? And those are conversations that are probably worth having with your team and, and getting some commitment around those. And then saying, we can be open about what this looks like, but it needs to be effective. And then you may need to do some iterative loops where you say, we're going to try this. How will we know if it's working? Here's how we're going to chat, communicate, and, and whether it's hybrid or remote first, here's how we're going to do that. And here's mm -hmm. how we're going to decide if it's working and do we commit and agree to be honest about, is it effective or not? And then we'll do another loop if we need to. Again, this is, this is iterative. There is a lot of people ask me for a silver bullet on any number of quest uh, performance questions, but what I find is that it's not, there isn't one tool or one hack to rule them all. No. It is about being willing to invest the effort and actually engage with people and do the hard work of problem solving together. Right. And, and if you if fail, it's yeah. get back up and try something different. Yes. And so that's like, it's going to be iterative and that's okay because actually some of our best solutions in science and otherwise, that's actually how we get there. I was interested in loving the way you were describing that just a moment ago about the process. And of course, my brain started going down a different, well, a similar, a parallel path, I'll say. Yeah. Of something we we weren't going to really go into about, you know, because it's the first of the year and everybody's talking about goal setting. But what you just went through in your iteration, and I'm going to ask people to go back and listen to this again, was basically smart goal setting. We go back to it is okay, what's going to work? Talk about how we're going to do it. We're going to find a way to measure it. We got to, once we measure, is this an attainable goal? Then we have to track our goals. We got to make sure we're tracking it and measuring it all the way through. And if it's not working, how are we going to verify that it's not working? If it is working, okay, what's our next step? Yes. It's and absolutely fascinating how you brought that to life. <laughs> well, and here's what I like about that. I honestly think that the moment we mentioned smart goals, like some people go to sleep, some people are like, oh, yes. No. And here's the thing, like 
we use goals in all sorts of weird ways. Like for example, some people use goals to beat themselves up. Like, ah, whenever I set a goal, if it doesn't quite go how I wanted it to go, then I just feel bad about myself. So I don't like to set goals. And I look at goals as a tool and you can deploy them in different ways. But I always like to say, is it serving you? The point of having a goal is to have it serve you, to have it help you focus, like you've identified where the direction you want to go, and to help you then figure out how you might judge working backwards, what kind of timeline might be realistic, what kinds of things might be most important. We're going mm -hmm. back to that first principle. What kinds of things might be the most important investments that would be a good process to drive you towards that thing? And what happens is sometimes people set a goal and they think it's this fixed thing. Like, oh, we don't want to move the goal, right? Because that's cheating. No, that's not cheating. Goals are a tool. So if you set a goal, then you There's start to think and backwards. Document. Right. Like you work backwards. If you suddenly are like, oh, well, really to get that launch, like to get that launch in the first, like first week of the year, wow, we'd really have to have people in on New Year's. Okay, they're not going to come in on New Year's. Okay, let's rethink that launch date. That's sort of a dumb example, but mm -hmm. it's really this point of you can work back and forth with your goals. And this is what I call the process of translating your fantasies, <laughs> right? Like we all have a dream, right? We have this dream in our head, but a dream is not a goal. And we have to translate the dream. And so setting a goal, then working backwards, getting started on it, then seeing sort of how that progress is going. And then saying, is that goal still realistic? Do I, have I learned something about the goal and what it would look like to realistically go after it? That means I should change either a timeline, a part of my process about how I'm going to invest or do inputs to get me mm -hmm. moving towards it. And you can sort of go back and forth in this calibration process or this translation of saying, I've got a dream in my head. But translating it, it's going to look different in reality. But reality is what matters because the stuff in my head, that just stays in my head. Yeah, that's just that. We're getting a little tight on time, but I want to make sure I hit this one question. What, what would you say are the top two or three key areas that leaders can invest in their people to really bring themselves as a leader up and be above above the crowd, be above others and strengthen their themselves. I'll put it that way. Yes. Great question. So we talked about, we talked about one of them already, which was this idea of how do you actually help people drive their own development that cultivate power? Mm -hmm. And then I actually think the second one is it's sort of my third principle. So I'm glad we're getting there. Mm -hmm. And this is something I really learned by being trained to be a scientist. And that is that a big, one of the best things you can train like, or help your team develop in themselves is this ability to approach uncertainty and have at least a working relationship with that uncertainty, if not comfort, then have a working relationship with how do you progress forward in work and life when things are uncertain, when you're doing something that has either some risk involved or just like, isn't a sure deal because most of the interesting stuff and the biggest opportunities in life, they're not a sure deal. Like that's why they're an opportunity. And I think what transforms the workplace and also your team is when your team isn't like coming to you, like, this is uncertain. Tell us what to do. What are we going to do? And everyone is just looking at the leader when actually the team starts to develop its relationship with uncertainty to say, what experiments could we run right now? And how could we view this as experiments versus like, oh, win or fail, right? But to say, how do we make sure that we are learning and growing in our understanding of how we win as we go along? And it's not something that the answer just exists on the internet. So we're going to have to figure it out. But if you can actually help your team learn the concept and say, this is actually creative versus scary. This is a normal part of life. And when you can feel comfortable with some uncertainty, a lot of doors start to open for you, both to become leaders of their own right, go lead their own teams. So 
I think that's the last thing, this idea of learning to relish uncertainty and giving your team tools for how they, rather than running to you when they have a question, can actually say, well, is this something I could actually figure out on my own? Mm -hmm. Not even just look it up, but what could I test or try? Right. Or what actions could I take that might answer this for me? So that's going to bring me down a path we do not have time to go into today. <laughs> because you're talking about getting into creativity. But how, in, in, in two minutes or less, if you can, <laughs> I'll try. how do you see AI factoring into this? Oh, wow. Big question. <laughs> Short answer. And again, I know we don't have time to go into AI today. AI is a tool. Like all tools, there are going to be great and wonderful things we can do with it. And mm -hmm. there will also be, of course, challenges and downsides to it. This has been true as a technological species, which we are. We will always push the boundaries of like, what are we doing with technology? So we're going there. And what I would say is that there are many interesting things you can do using the tool of AI. The goal should not be to like put our brains to sleep. Exactly. So it's, you want to, you want to be at the wheel and, you know, I've done run some few experiments with like, you know, AI companion on zoom and like, you know, they make, they take meeting notes for you and all this, all this stuff. And I think one of the important pieces is just sometimes it sort of more or less smooths everything out. You know, it can go source from the data that it's out there and bring you interesting things, but you still have to say like, what's the meaning of this? What is the meaning of the results it has brought me back? And you got to stay at the wheel. You got to keep thinking about it independently, not just saying I can now just get answers. Right. So from the performance science point of view, a leader might be able to use AI or the team might be able to use AI but they've got to come back and be able to dissect that information effectively. And am I going down the path? That's a great way to put it. Yeah. So if we go down that path and use it to our advantage in that direction, I think that's really, really key. That's, that's so key. So if yes. we could talk in the last minute or two we have, mm -hmm. if we could just hit, what's one thing that a team leader can do tomorrow to really increase his or her performance science? Oh, love this. I would recommend book even 30 minutes, find something in your schedule that, and time and just sit down and spend some time thinking about like, what is it, where are we headed? What is it we want to have happen? What do I actually think is most important that we are doing towards that? Like, okay, and so we go back to brutal. Brutal focus. Start with brutal focus because everything else is easier once you've had that time to think. And then if you want to do a second thing, book another half an hour next week. I think this is so critical and it often is what gets squeezed out for leaders is that time to think and process, which is probably one of their most important value adds to the team is like that because they're holding it. Part of leadership is you are the person sort of holding, you know, mm -hmm. what is the direction of the team? What are some of the priorities of the team? Like, and that's not to say the team can't have responsibility for that also, but as a leader, you were the one who said, I will hold it. So. And that's, uh, I love the fact that you said take 30 minutes because so often people are saying, sit down, plan a weekend to do your strategy planning for, and everything. Else. You're saying take 30 minutes and think about it. I think we can all block 30 minutes a week for a while just to try and get ourselves a little more focused. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. If folks want to reach out to you, what's the best way they can find you? Two great places to find me. One, if they are interested in learning more about coaching or any of that, my website's a great resource. And that is at thaxa.com, T-H-A-X-A. And so there's lots of questions answered there, but also links to other conversations that I've been on. And then if they're just interested in following along in the conversation around performance science, I'm on LinkedIn and that's at Carla-Fowler. 
And so I'm always posting little quotes or conversations that I have okay. about this topic and we cover lots of different things. So that's a great place to follow. And we'll have all of that information in the show notes so folks can go back into there and get that same information along those lines. Carla, maybe we can get you back on here and talk a little bit more about science and where people happen to be in a few months about where they are in the middle of the year as opposed to right now as we start off 2024. So. Love that idea. <laughs> Fantastic. Dr. Carla Fowler, performance science. That's a word that I don't think I had actually paid attention to until a couple of weeks ago when we looked at doing this particular interview. Folks, the Teamwork Advantage is a podcast that is focused on dedicating you and helping you grow your teams, build better leaders, and develop a culture that is a powerful winning culture. I'm glad to help you. If you want to chat with me, you can reach out to me at any time. And we'll talk about connecting you with some of our guests. We'll talk about how we can connect you with getting performance training done for your teams. Until next week, remember, having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know you're not average. So go make today excellent and exceptional. Take care.